Hi, I'm Dr. Justin Estri. Uh, this is Paul 280, uh, day two. And uh, what we're going to focus on today is a little more advanced descriptive statistics and graphs uh, using R and RStudio. It'll be continuing on the lesson that we did previously uh, using basic data types and some basic plots and descriptive statistics in R. Uh, so if you haven't watched that video already, you should probably go ahead and watch that one first. Otherwise, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so we're continuing where we left off in the last lecture video. So uh, we're still working with the week1.r data set. Or I'm sorry, a script file in R. So make sure you have your week1.r script file open. You might need to change your working directory to the Paul280 folder. And if you want to check where your working directory is, you can just type git wd in parentheses, and it'll tell you where you are. If you're in your home, you need to change that to your uh, Paul280 folder. Uh, you can click on week1.r to open this file. So if this was closed, you could just open, click uh, week1.r and it would open. And uh, run the first three commands in here. Uh, those will automatically set uh, clear your workspace, first of all. Uh, open the foreign library, which we will need to open some state of data sets. And also set the working directory to Paul280 in case you haven't already done that. Okay, so uh, once you've done that, uh, we're going to continue with some uh, analysis of the human rights data set that we talked about in the last lecture. That's a data set that's talked about in the Monaghan book, Political Analysis Using R. So uh, again, if you hadn't watched the previous video, that might help. But what we're going to start off with uh, today is, uh, in this lecture video, is uh, generating categorical uh, uh, dummy variables and conversely changing categorical dummy variable or uh, categorical variables into numeric variables. So let's take a look at one particular uh, variable, the GMP cats variable, and see how we would make this uh, transformation. Actually, before we get to that uh, GMP cats variable, uh, let's first just do a pretty simple dummy variable. And uh, this relies on the Boolean statements that we talked about last time, like the equals equals here and the less than sign. There are two Boolean statements here. And uh, what we're going to do is use these uh, along with uh, some related commands uh, to transform uh, uh, or essentially to create uh, dummy variables. Uh, dummy variables uh, take on two values, a one or a zero. They're called dummies because they um, sort of stand in for a particular kind of category as uh, a dummy stands in for a person. I guess that's not that great of a metaphor now that I think about it, but I didn't make it up. Um, so suppose we want to create a dummy variable or an indicator uh, variable. Uh, that's coded one if a country is in a civil war and simultaneously had an above average level of democracy. And then it'll be coded zero otherwise. So uh, what we want is observations in our human rights data set that are experiencing a civil war. So that's civ underscore war is one. And also are experiencing, uh, or rather have democracy values that are greater than 5.3, which uh, we saw in the earlier video is the average value of democracy. And we could verify that very quickly by going to our, our studio and just typing mean human. Uh, oh, we do need to load the human rights data set again because that's probably not loaded in. So uh, you'll want to run line 29 in this week one.r file. That should load the data set into your environment. You can check that it's there now. And we want to calculate the mean of human rights democ. Oh, there must be some missing values in this. So we need to set na.rm equals true. That takes out, uh, what this does is it says any missing values uh, in the democracy score, so any countries for which you don't have an observation of democracy, will be excluded from this mean calculation. So the mean of one and an unknown missing value is unknown. But if we drop the missing value, the mean is one, right? Because there's only one value. So this na.rm equals true drops those missing values. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted capital T. Uh, oh, and I'm missing a parenthesis. There we go. So 5.3. That is indeed the mean. So going back here, I want democracy scores bigger than 5.3. And there's the ampersand. That's a Boolean comparator, uh, or rather a Boolean state. Um, value that we, uh, or a Boolean operator, that's the word I'm looking for, Boolean operator that we talked about last time. Uh, and we want the Civil War score to equal one. So this new variable right here, dem.civ, should be a one if a country is in a civil war and also has an above average level of democracy. So if I go into the human rights data set, 
You can actually see on line 46, I've already got this command that was in the slideshow already loaded up. So you can either type it into your console or just highlight it and hit control return. Uh, nothing magical happens, but you may see that instead of having eight variables, now this human rights data set has nine variables. Why did that happen? Well, we use the left pointing arrow to create and store a new value. That new thing, that new value, that new vector or variable was called dem.siv. And the dollar sign human rights here means it's a variable inside of the human rights data frame called dem.siv. And in fact, if you open this up, you'll see there's a new variable called dem.siv in here. Now, and that's just whatever's on the right hand side here. So if you were to just run what's inside that as numeric on the right hand side, what you'd get is a bunch of true and false commands, or I'm sorry, true and false statements. That makes sense because if you think about how these Boolean operators work, what it's telling you is for each one of these observations is civil war equal one and simultaneously democracy score bigger than 5.3. Many are false, some are true, some are missing because at least one, maybe both of those variables are missing. So it's doing what it should. Uh, to create a, var a variable um, like we can use in some common analyses, we wanna change trues and falses into numbers. So by convention, trues are stored as one, false are stored as zero. So if I run this again, all the missing stay missing, but all the falses become zero, all the trues become ones. So that is what ultimately ends up in this data set, a bunch of ones and zeros. That's the sort of full statement. We can verify that this actually worked as we thought by uh, constructing some tables to show us that this actually worked right. So, for example, if we look at a table, we can just see there were 149 zeros and one four and four ones, which means there are only four cases where a country is both simultaneously in a civil war and also has a high democracy score. We could verify those are the right numbers by also looking in and doing human rights, democracy, democ, and then uh, human rights dollar sign um, civil war. And that basically spits out um, a bunch of uh, values uh, of the Civil War score, one or zero, and the democracy score, you can see one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And we can see, in fact, there are two, three, four, only four cases where the Civil War is one and the democracy score is greater than five. In this case, six or bigger. So, in fact, that this table verifies that our little uh, dummy, dummy variable command did what we thought it did. It identified those countries that are simultaneously experiencing a civil war and also um, uh, are uh, sort of high on the democracy scale. We can see what countries those are if we want. Uh, so the country, if you do names, human rights, you can see country is a variable in there. So what I wanna do is I wanna get the country name for only those observations that are experiencing civil war and simultaneously have high democracy scores. So those are the observations for which dem.siv equals one, equals equals one. So if I were to just run this thing in the brackets, I would get a bunch of trues and falses, just like we originally got actually when we created these variables. And now if I use those trues and falses inside of the brackets, what that's gonna do is it's gonna identify those, those observations in the human rights data set for the country variable for which this condition is true. So you can see there are only a small number of observations, there are a bunch of missings, but really there are only four where this is true. Colombia, India, the Philippines, and Turkey. Uh, so in other words, those are the four countries that are relatively high in the democracy scale and we're also experiencing a civil war in this data set. In this data set, uh, currents of 1993, I believe. Uh, we also could have done this with the subset command, which we talked about earlier. So I could have created a subset of the human rights data set, and the subset argument could have had dem.siv equals equals one, which would have pulled out only those countries that are experiencing a civil war and are higher on the democracy scale. In other words, dem.save equals one. And you can see again, now I'm listing the entire, all the variables for this because I created a whole subset in here. And you can see Colombia, India, the Philippines, and Turkey are all in here. So we've 
those are the countries that sort of meet the conditions that we wanted. Now you may be able to see you can use these combinations of uh, factors to create dummy variables that indicate a wide variety of conditions and that can enable you to do analyses on countries that meet whatever configuration of uh, um, conditions that you're interested in. Uh, so for example uh, you can use this technique to figure out how many countries have democracy scores of less than six. So we want democracy scores. Uh, sorry about that. Jeez, I can, can call over the place. Uh, democracy scores less than six and log population scores of less than 16. So to check to make sure you can do this, why don't you, uh, in your RStudio, try this out, pause the video, and once you've got an answer, come back and we'll check and see if your answer is correct. All right, so we want democracy scores less than six and um, log populations of, was it less than 16? Less than six and less than 16. So going into our studio here, uh, what I wanna do is just, I'll just create some random variable. We'll call it um, autocracy.smallpopulation. And that's gonna be set, uh, it's gonna be sort of set equal to one. Uh, in the condition where um, the democracy score is less than six and uh, LPOP, the log population, is less than 16. And the key is how many of countries meet these characteristics. Uh, so you can see it actually stored this um, it actually didn't store it in the data set because I didn't tell it to store it in the data set, so it just stored it in the regular value. If I wanted it to be in the data set, I'd need to change this to say human rights dollar sign. And you can see it also stored it as falses and trues. And if I, so if I want to store this as a number, it's probably best if I wrap this in as numeric, which does exactly what it says it does. It just converts that to a zero and one. Okay, now I've got that. Now I want to know how many countries meet this criteria. So if I just sum up human rights, autocracy small, well, I get an NA because there are some missing values in here. So I've got to tell it, I want to omit the NAs. We're going to treat those as, as though they don't exist. And finally, we get 25. So there are 25 countries that are both sort of leaning autocratic or actually autocratic and also have small populations. And that's one of our possible values. That's 25. So that's the right answer. So uh, just to give you a few more examples of how this uh, recoding procedure can be used. So uh, you, uh, we've already discussed in, in this lecture and the previous lecture that the population variable in this data set is actually a log population variable, which tends to allow us to compare the really, really big population countries with countries that have relatively smaller populations. Let's say you actually just wanted the raw population figures though. Well, uh, log in, uh, at least the default log in, in R is log base N, I'm sorry, log base E. So that means that the exponential function and the log function in R are uh, annihilators. In other words, they cancel each other out. So if we wanted to transform the log population into the regular population, we could create a new variable just called pop instead of LPOP take the exponential of that uh, of that variable, actually let me raise this, take the exponential of that variable and we would get what we wanted. We can also, if we want, we can com uh, combine um, their other variables and sort of create new variables. So for example, if I wanna create a new variable that's coded two, if a country's in a civil war and an international war, one if it's only in one or the other, and zero if neither. I could just add together the civil war and the in interstate war uh, variables, and then I would get this ordinal war measure. You could also imagine uh, creating something that's just, whoops, that's not very legible, that's just an indicator of uh, whether a country is in any sort of war at all. So you might imagine doing just war, and then storing, uh, essentially if the country is experiencing a civil war or it's experiencing an internal war. So you might do something like human rights, dollar sign, civ war, or human rights, dollar sign, int war. 
that's going to create trues and falses. So you might want to put all that in parentheses and then put an as numeric on the left hand side there to basically turn it into an as numeric. So you might want to like right here, you know, I'm running out of room here, but as numeric. And that would give you a one if a country is experiencing either kind of war uh, and a zero if not. So there are lots of ways you can use R as a, it's a sort of calculator features and it's data management features uh, to create the variables you need to perform the analysis you want to perform. All right, here's a relatively uh, more complex recoding problem that you can do in R. So uh, the GNP cats variable in the human rights data set is formatted um, uh, uh, as a sort of a text figure or a text string. So if you go into um, the R studio here, where is it? There it is. And you look at what's actually in human rights GNP cats. Oh, it's actually, this is formatted as a, uh, this is a factor variable. So it's got four levels, less than a thousand, a thousand to nineteen ninety nine, two thousand to twenty nine ninety nine, three thousand to thirty nine ninety nine, and greater than four thousand. That's dollars per capita, uh, gross national product. So um, we might want to recode this from uh, being a factor uh, to being a, a a number, where one is the lowest value, two is the sort of second lowest value, three is the middle value, four is the penultimate the highest value and five is the highest value. So uh, line 76 through 81 in this uh, code, which are actually also duplicated here in the, um, in the uh, um, PowerPoint, uh, accomplish this. And so let's talk about what's actually going on here. So the first thing I'm doing in this very first line number 76 is I'm creating a, a variable called GNP ORD for ordinal, it's an ordered value, um, ordered variable. And I'm setting all the values equal to empty or NA. NA means missing value. So you can see here in the environment, they're all set to being nothing. Um, then I wanna gradually replace each one uh, of the observations with the appropriate number. Now the reason I start with nothing is because anything for which GNP cats is actually missing. I actually don't, I see a couple of missings. There's a missing right here. Those are gonna stay missing because we're only gonna replace uh, um, the GNP ORD variable with numbers where there's an extant non-missing value for the original GNP cats variable. So if you look at what's inside the brackets here, human rights dollar sign GNP cats equals equals and then in, in quotation marks, less than a thousand. If you look at what's in there, you get a bunch of falses and trues and some missings, right? So just like before, if you put this into the brackets, what that does, GNP or it is a vector, right? It's a variable, but uh, it's coded as a vector. This, uh, putting this into brackets, pulls out only those observations for which this condition is true. So if I look at GNP ORD, if I just were to type that, I'd get a bunch of NAs. But if I included that bracket condition, I'd only get certain, certain entries, right? You can see this vector is a lot shorter than that vector. It's because it's only pulling out the observations for which GNP cats is actually less than a thousand. So what I want to do is I don't just want to pull them out. I want to store in those spaces a one. So now if I were to repeat GNP ORD, there'd be ones everywhere where the GNP cats variable was equal to less than a thousand. You can see my text strings here all match these, vari these uh, value labels that were present in that factor. So if I just repeat this for 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, and greater than 4,000, and then I look at the GNP ORD variable, you can see what was originally a bunch of um, categories, I've now transformed into a one to five variable. And in fact, if I do a table of the GNP cats var uh, variable, so you can see less than 1,000, there are 66 observations, 21 observations between 1,000 and 1999, 16 from 2,000 to 2999, and so on. And then I compare that to the GNP ORD variable I just created, the distributions of the statistics are the same. So that tells me that this recoding process actually worked because I'm getting the same distribution of the data in the new variable that I got in the old variable. So that's a good indication that this works. So this is a little insight into how you can use R to do uh, more complicated recoding problems using the uh, Boolean operators and, and the little bracket commands to pull out particular observations.
All right, so recoding variables is important and necessary, but perhaps a little dull. Uh, let's get to some actual uh, data visualization. And I wanna teach, uh, teach you a couple of important plots that you see all the time, not just in R, of course, but, but in everywhere there's data analysis. Uh, one of these is a histogram. I'm sure you've seen a histogram before. It's a plot of the frequency of the occurrence of observations in the data set of some variable of interest. So uh, for example, and the command here uh, in R to create a histogram is appropriately enough, hist, and you put inside of the parentheses the variable for which you would like to have a histogram. So earlier when we did a summary of the democracy variable, uh, we pointed out, or we noted rather, that um, democracy seemed to be bimodal. There seemed to be a lot of countries at zero and a lot of countries at 10 and not very many in the middle. And uh, we could uh, verify that by creating a histogram of democracy. So before I type in this whole command, I'm just going to type just this one part of it. This is what would happen if you let R choose all the defaults. So I'm going to do Control L to clear everything out here. And I'm just going to type hist human rights democ, nothing else. Everything's going to be set to the default. And uh, this is what you get. So you get a, a bar chart of a kind where each bar represents a bin. So this, for example, goes from zero to one, this goes from one to two, this goes from two to three, and so on, up to zero, uh, up from nine to 10. And it tells you the number of countries that are in each one of these bins. And as we suspected, there are a lot of countries on the left-hand side that are essentially pure autocracies or close to pure autocracies. And there are a lot of countries on the right-hand side, which are almost pure democracies. They're getting scores of nine or 10. And then, sort of not much in the middle. Some in the middle, but not near as many. Uh, you can, just like any command, um, there are lots of things, there are lots of ways you can customize a histogram. And so uh, one thing we can do is we can change exactly where these bars are centered. So there's a particular default for the breaks, which is where the bars are actually sort of located. I'm gonna modify my original command so that instead of the breaks being automatically chosen, they start at negative 0.5 and they go to 10.5 and every break is separated by one. And let me show you what this does. Now that's a pretty subtle difference, right? So you go this and to that. There's not a huge difference there, but you may notice now the bars are actually centered on a particular value. So we know for the democracy score, the way this is coded, every country just gets a zero or a one or a two. There's no such thing as like a 1.4 on this scale. And we know that because if we type table human rights democ, we see that only whole numbers get scores, only integers get scores. So what I've done is I've sort of rejiggered the breaks a little bit so that they're centered on the number that represents this bin. So for example, this first bin we now know is only zeros. And this bin is only ones, and this bin is only twos, and this bin is only threes. And that's because we define the breaks so that they essentially cannot overlap a category. So it's you know, not that much different, but it conveys the information a little, a little more clearly, I think. Whereas the old one, uh, is this bin zeros or ones? <laughs> you know, unless you knew the answer in advance, you might not know that, right? So now we know it's zeros, and this is ones, and this is twos, and so on. Uh, I can also do some other stuff. I can add an X label. So X lab is an option here and I can put text on the X axis. I can put different labels on the Y axis and I can add a little main is the option for this title here. So if I type command on line 89 and 90, what I get is, again, comparing this to this, it's the same thing. I've just customized the labels a little bit. I've changed the X label right here. I've changed the Y label right here. I've changed the label of the plot there. And you can always find out what these options are, again, by look, doing question mark and then looking for sort of what options are available. There's xlim, ylim, xlabel, ylabel, and you know, all the stuff I used. So this just makes it a little prettier. So what is nice about this is we can confirm our intuition from earlier about this data set that in fact, uh, it seems, at least in this one particular data set, that uh, countries are not uh, scattered randomly or evenly uniformly throughout the democracy space. In fact, what appears to happen is countries tend to gravitate toward one of the two poles and uh, they stay away from mixed systems where there's some 
uh, some democratic uh, elements and some autocratic elements, which is an interesting fact in of its own and, and possibly, maybe even probably theoretically relevant. So that's a lot you can learn from a, a very simple data visualization. Now you've probably seen a box and whisker plot at some point, but it's not as common as a histogram. It could be very informative though. So a box and whisker plot, like a histogram, shows you something about the distribution of the data. Uh, when, in particular, what it shows you is the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile of uh, a variable. So uh, just to recollection, in case you haven't covered this in some other class, uh, 25th percentile is uh, a number such that 25% of the observations in like a sample, maybe in a population, if it's, if it's a percentile of a population, are smaller than this value. And that's true for any percentile. So the 50th percentile, 50% 50 of observations are smaller than this value. And there's a special name for the 50th percentile. Uh, this is the median. You may have heard of the median. It's the number in the sample or population or whatever data set where there's an equal number of observations bigger and smaller than it. So that's a common measure of central tendency, which we'll revisit later in the class. So a box and whisker plot shows you the 25th, 5th, 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles. It also shows you uh, a range of data that, that falls within 1.5 times the interquartile range. And the interquartile range is whatever the 75th percentile is minus whatever the 25th percentile is. Uh, and then a box will show you the data that ranges in 1.5 times that range. So any observation that falls more than 1.5 times the interquartile range away from the median, so this is actually distance from the median, those will be represented not by whiskers, but by points. So the easiest way to understand how this works is to show you a box plot. And so what I'm gonna show you is a box plot of population uh, by Civil War status. And so if I go back to uh, my R console here, uh, line 93 creates this box plot, and just to, I'll do it first and then talk about what I'm doing. So uh, what this is doing here is it's creating a box plot of population, population, log population rather, is on the y-axis. And the formula here is squiggle civil war. So I'm going to separately create plots for countries that are not experiencing a civil war, that's zero, and that are experiencing a civil war, and that's one. Okay, so we, we sort of focus in on this. The bold line is the median. That's the 50th percentile. You can see the 50th percentile is actually higher uh, for countries experiencing a civil war compared to those not. So civil war countries tend to be a little bigger. This is the 50 or 75th percentile right here at the top of the box for each of the two categories. This is the 25th percentile for each of the two categories. And then these are the minimum and maximum values respectively, the range of the data as long as those data points fall within 1.5 times the IQR. So basically 1.5 times the, this box width away from the median. If any observation is further than that distance away from the median, it becomes a dot. And those dots are often referred to as outliers. They're essentially observations that are far from the ordinary distribution of the data. All right, so what is this telling me? What this is telling me is well, first of all, there's much more variation in population among countries not experiencing civil war than countries that are experiencing a civil war. You can see there aren't a whole lot of countries uh, in the civil war cases that are small. The range doesn't range that far. Also, the measure of central tendency or the median is higher for the civil war countries. There is an outlier in both cases, perhaps not particularly informative, but only one. So if I was asking the question, are human rights, uh, I'm sorry, are civil rights, <laughs> civil rights, are countries experiencing civil wars tend, are bigger on average than countries that aren't, uh, this plot might lead me to believe, well, maybe, you know, the countries experiencing a civil war seem to, you know, have the 25th, 75th, and 50th percentile are all sort of bigger. Uh, and there's a much shallower range in the uh, civil war uh, countries. Uh, I can improve this a little bit. So what I can do is I can create instead of, so the, right now the way the Civil War variable is coded 
it's a zero or one or missing. Uh, what I could do is I could create a factor variable. So now I'm going in the opposite direction of the GNP cats case. In the GNP cats, I was going from a factor to a number. Now I'm going from a number to a factor. And if you look, question mark factor, this creates a factor variable. These are essentially category variables. And so what I'm doing is I'm going to create two categories, uh, countries that aren't experiencing a civil war. That's a level of zero and a label of no civil war. And countries that are that are experiencing a civil war. That's a label of one. I'm sorry, a level of one and a category uh, label of civil war. So if I create this variable called civ war f, you can see I'm storing it in the human rights data set here. It's a factor variable. It has level zero, one, and these two labels. And then I do a table of let's see, civ war. Civ or F, they're the same variable. The only difference is this Civ or F is a factor and it's got nice pretty text labels, no Civil War and Civil War, whereas the original variable is just a zero and a one. So now if I do a box plot of LPOP versus Civ War F instead of Civ War, what I get is nice x-axis labels corresponding to those categories. That looks nice. I add a Y label of log population, that kind of knows what that is. I add a, what you call it, I add a, a title to the graph of population by civil war occurrence. So that appears right here. And now I have a really nice informative graph telling me something about how population varies uh, according to whether a country is experiencing civil war. So the box plot is something you, you don't see quite as often in infographics, but you see them a lot. And uh, they can be really informative and helpful ways to summarize the distribution of a variable. Uh, where a histogram doesn't tell you exactly what you want to know. It's also a nice way to compare the distribution of variables across, of some variable rather, across multiple categories, in this case the civil wars. All right, so let's check to see if you can use these uh, tools we just learned. So there are two questions here. Uh, one is, is there a relationship between propensity to engage in interstate war and democracy levels? So democracy is more or less likely to engage in civil, in interstate war rather. And do states with low per capita GNP, we'll say less than 2,000, tend to have smaller populations? So uh, pause the video, try to answer these two questions, and then we'll come back and do the answers together. Okay, let's start with the first one. Is there a relationship between propensity to engage in interstate war and democracy? So probably the easiest way to do this is to create a box plot. And what I'd like to do is... Um, I'll probably have democracy score on the y-axis because that's a continuous, a relative, not exactly continuous, but more continuous, at least more continuous than, um, uh, was it civil, uh, what am I doing? Civil war? Interstate war. Interstate war is binary. So not gonna get a lot of interesting box plot action out of that. So I wanna make that the category. And I wanna specify the data equals human rights. Okay. So I've got democracy score on the y-axis here. I've got countries that are not engaging in interstate war, countries that are engaging in interstate war. And uh, you can see it's not the best box plot in the world, a lot of sort of blockiness involved here. Uh, but the median value of the democracy score is higher for those countries engaging in interstate war. And um, it looks like more of the data is locate is sort of located at lower democracy scores for those countries that are engaged or not engaged rather in interstate war compared to the democracy score or the democ uh, the uh, countries that are engaging in interstate war where the 25th percentile is considerably higher. So it looks like there might be a little bit of evidence, um, although these distributions overlap quite a lot, that uh, countries that engage in interstate war are more likely to be democracies. Uh, Another thing I wanted to ask is do states with, so I would say, oh, just to finish this up, I would say, this is, you know, maybe. <laughs> do states with low per capita G GNP, so less than $2,000 per capita, tend to have smaller populations? So I'm looking at the relationship between per capita GNP uh, and smaller populations. So uh, again, going into my R Studio. I probably want to just come in here and I want to do a log population as the y variable. And I want to do um, 
Uh, what was the independent variable again? Per capita GNP. Well, okay. I need to create a binary per capita GNP variable because I don't have one of those. So let's see. I do have several GNP variables. I have the GNP ORD. So uh, the category two is the one corresponding to, let's see. Cor category two correspond, uh, corresponds to less than $2,000, so two and one. So basically I wanna create a dummy variable. We'll call it low GNP. Uh, I'm gonna store that as a blank. And then I'm gonna say, I want this to be coded as a one if uh, GNP.ORD is either a one or it's a two. So now I should have a bunch of ones, and I do. And now I want uh, to store it as a zero if this value is bigger than two. Oh wait, did I just, <laughs> did I accidentally store it all as, oh, I replaced, oh. I don't know why I ran that line I'm in. I made a mistake. Okay, so I need to go run, uh, so here we go. One, two, there we go. Uh, uh. Oh, it's running, it's storing those both as commands. Okay, funny. All right, I'm caught in a loop. So here's the ones. I wanna get rid of this. There's the zeros. Bam, finally. So the ones are countries where the GNP.org is bigger, is less than or equal to two. The uh, zeros are those countries that have GNPs bigger than the two. Uh, that corresponds to those two categories uh, that we want for low GNP. And then finally, I can do a box plot of, I wanna do, is it population? Yes. So I wanna do LPOP against low GNP and I want to, this is the data is the human rights data set. Okay, so these are low GNP countries. These are high GNP countries. Uh, GNP per capita is literally involves population in the measure because it's per person. So you might think countries with tons of people have probably lower GNP per capita because they just have more people to share among whatever they're producing. But of course, more people is also a factor of production. So maybe they're able to make more, who knows? Uh, these distributions are very, very similar. The median is only slightly higher in log population for those low GNP countries. And the range is very, very similar with just a couple of outliers in the low GNP country, but there are outliers on both sides. So if I go back to my original question, do countries with low or states with low per capita GNP tend to have pop smaller populations? I would say no. They actually tend to have very slightly larger populations, right? Going back to my R studio, um, but the difference is not particularly meaningful. That's a that's a that's a that's no difference really. All right, uh, let's move on to a little more applied example. One interesting source of data that's become uh, very uh, widely studied and widely used recently are prediction markets. And uh, prediction markets are supposed to use the power of markets to enable us to, uh, to use the wisdom of the crowd to forecast the future. That's how they're, that's how they're designed to work. And uh, here's how it works. So uh, what, a pro uh, what happens is um, you ask people to bet on various propositions uh, by buying securities, okay? so. If the proposition is correct uh, at by some certain time and you own the security, you receive a dollar. And if the proposition is wrong and you own the security, you get nothing. Uh, 
So a proposition might be something like, you know, in October of 2016, you might buy a proposition that Donald Trump is going to win the 2016 presidential election. So you pay for that security, you pay some price for it, and if he wins the election, which he did, you'd get a dollar for every share you earned, you, every every uh, security you owned. But if he had lost, if Hillary had won instead, you'd just be stuck with a worthless security. You'd have nothing. So the way these work is, uh, if you sort of think about it from a rational choice perspective, people should be willing to pay only a price up to uh, the probability that they think the event will occur. So, for example, suppose uh, in, in, the, in this Donald Trump uh, president's presidency example, suppose the price of the security, let's just say, was 90 cents. Okay? Now, and suppose I thought it's a toss-up. The, 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 the election could go either way, right? It's 50-50 chance. So, on the day of the election, uh, if I own the security, I've got a 50% chance of getting a dollar, and I've got a 50% chance of getting no dollar. <laughs> and so the expected value of that security is 50 cents, right? I'm not gonna put that up period there because it looks too much like a decimal point. Delete. Uh, there we go. Let's get rid of that. Oh, no. Uh, okay, try this again. There we go. So that security, if I believed there was a 50-50 chance of Donald Trump winning, would be worth 50 cents to me, right? And I don't pay more than things are worth. So if the price is 90 cents and I think it's worth 50 cents, I'm not going to buy it. So what happens is everyone has their own views about these probabilities, right? Everyone has some view of the probability that President Trump's going to win. Uh, well, at that time, candidate Trump is going to become president. And they buy and sell their securities based on those beliefs. They try to buy low and sell high, right? That's how markets work. And um, the price that clears the market, which is to say the price for which no one is willing to buy or sell a share, is the market's belief about the probability that this event will occur. So if on a certain day the price is 90 cents, what that means is the market believes there's a 90% chance of Donald Trump winning the election. So that's how these prediction markets work. They're really cool. They, they use the wisdom of the crowd. They use market logic. Uh, and there are all kinds of prop bets that people put into these security markets. So here's, a, here's one of them. Uh, the proposition is uh, Obama will pardon Chelsea Manning. Okay, so Obama's not president anymore. This is uh, this was being recorded in 2018. Uh, Obama, in fact, uh, did pardon Chelsea Manning. I believe she's running for Senate now, or was running for Senate. I don't know, if, I don't know how her candidacy is going. I assume she lost because I haven't heard about it recently, but I don't know. Um, however, uh, at the time, she was in jail. And the question was, is uh, President Obama going to pardon her? And you can see, uh, over time, this security went from being basically worth nothing uh, because people thought there was a very low probability of it occurring, and then spiking in value to about 60 cents, and then uh, it sort of lowered out about 40 cents. And in fact, uh, Obama did pardon Chelsea Manning eventually. So anyone who owned the security got a dollar uh, on the day that she was pardoned. They would have gotten nothing on the day Obama left office if Obama had chosen not to pardon. Uh, we have uh, data from this market in our RStudio server. So if you clear out your existing information and then reading the Manning, uh, the Manning, pardon, Manning pardon data, um, we can create a little line plot of what that share price was over time. And so the data we have are a bunch of dates uh, and a bunch of prices. And so this Lubridate package or library helps us deal with dates a little bit. So we can create the, the, the text date, uh, which is originally there, into a real date, a date date, <laughs> which R understands as a date. And then we can plot the closing share price for each day in this market against that date. And we can make a red line and we can make it a line plot and it should look pretty good. And for those of you who are actually in Poly 208, you should recognize this as being very similar to a problem that's on your homework. And it's, I'm using a little bit of a different, in the homework I actually suggested you create a sort of a day index, 
But if you want to, you can use this lubridate library and this date command in a similar way to convert uh, your text date into a real date and make a line plot. There's, all, there's almost always multiple ways of doing things correctly in R. So uh, I have this, this uh, stuff all created for you, this code all created for you in the week one.r data set. So I'm gonna clear out my existing information. I'm gonna load in the Manning data library. I'm sorry, the, the Manning data data set. I'm going to open the Lubridate library uh, and I'm going to convert the date into an actual date. And then I'm gonna plot the closing share price against the date. And uh, I'm gonna play with some of the S. This is just a very simple plot. I'm gonna give it a title, I'm gonna label the date, I'm gonna label the probability of share price, I'm gonna change the line to be red, uh, and I'm gonna set the limits of Y, the Y axis. Y lim is concatenate 0, 060, it's gonna set the minimum value at zero cents and the maximum value at 60 cents. And so if I run this whole thing, uh, ooh, that is ugly. I'm gonna do this to make it prettier. Uh -huh. This little trick, you can actually link together multiple arguments in the main command and then they go to the next line. That's cool. So this is the probability of Obama granting a pardon or commutation uh, specifically to, this one is for Chelsea Manning, okay? And you can see uh, in December, the probability was you know, in the toilet, 10% or less. That was the share price at the close, 10 cents. And then something happens on like January 10th, some news comes out and bam, suddenly the probability spikes. People start buying and selling securities because they think the probability has gone up. And in fact, in the last day of this time series, uh, um, Manny gets her pardon. And so everyone who owned the, sh uh, everyone who owned the share on this date uh, made a profit of 60 cents per share. So they were either lucky or smart, depending on how you think about it. Well, we also have identical kind of data, but instead of Chelsea Manning getting a pardon, it's Edward Snowden, who you may remember as uh, a person who released tons of sensitive um, classified documents um, about NSA activities, uh, and then fled the country um, eventually to, I believe he lives in Russia now. Um, so uh, uh, President Obama could have also pardoned um, uh, Edward Snowden, uh, and we have data. This is the Snowden pardon.csv data set. So just to remind you, this is both the Manning and the Snowden data are comma separated variables. So it's uh, comma separated variable files, which means this is a text file in both cases. It's a text file with uh, every line having two values, a price and a date. And those values are separated by commas and then a carrier return sort of indicates the next observation. So read.csv allows R to read in those comma separated variable file formats into R. I basically rerun everything I ran for the Manning data set for changing the name to Snowden. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a blue line for the closing share price and the date for the Snowden data. So I'm gonna put this right on top of this data set. That's the Snowden price. And in fact, I can even add a little legend. So if you wanna know how these work, just type question mark legend. You'll get some information about how, how you can add legends to plots. But just to fill you in right now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it in the top left corner because there's lots of space there. I'm gonna put in values for Manning and Snowden. The Manning color is red, the Snowden color is blue, and both are just straight lines. LTY equals C11. LTY is short for line type. Line type one means regular line. <laughs> so I type this command and now I get a nice little legend. So what this is telling me is that prediction markets always thought there was a lesser chance for Edward Snowden to get a pardon than Chelsea Manning. Uh, this was intimated by some things that Obama had said about the difference between Chelsea Manning, who actually did face justice, who had a court case, uh, was convicted, spent time in prison, versus Edward Snowden, who fled the country uh, to avoid um, uh, going to a court case. I'm, he believed that he would surely be convicted um, and that the greater social context of his actions would not be taken into account by the court, which I guess we'll never know. Maybe he was right. Maybe he was wrong. Uh, but anyway, uh, Obama had indicated that for this reason, he had always uh, looked more favorably upon Manning's case than, uh, Chel uh, than Snowden's, 
when it came time for a pardon. So uh, that probability for Manning was always a bit higher than for Snowden, and there was no spike. And in fact, Snowden didn't receive a pardon. So uh, that never, I don't think Snowden ever broke 10% in terms of his probability of, um, of uh, receiving a pardon as estimated by these prediction and forecasting markets. All right, so um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you learned a little bit about how to create some interesting plots, do some interesting data manipulation with R. Uh, and I will see you uh, next time when we continue with our study of uh, statistics and data analysis uh, in political science uh, using R in R Studio.